I'm Sue Donarski. I'm co-director of the Education Policy Initiative at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. Nice to see you all here today. So this policy talk uh, lecture marks the opening of the conference on student loans, which would not have been possible without the generous support of our co-sponsors. Um, uh, and I'd like to recognize um, the Upjohn Institute and the Spencer Foundation um, uh, for uh, their, uh, their work and their funds in making this um, uh, uh, event happen. So thanks so much. So this conference is going to be bringing together some of the countries, I didn't write this, some of the country's top minds on an issue that not only interests us but affects m many of us uh, in the room. So today's speaker is um, President Obama's Special Assistant for Education Policy, um, Roberto Rodriguez. Um, the most important thing to know about Roberto Rodriguez is that he's a Wolverine. So he's an alumnus of the University of Michigan. He also um, got a degree from Harvard um, in education, um, but that's okay. Uh, since then, he's been a disappointment. He was chief education counsel to the late Senator Ted Kennedy, um, assisting in the development of education legislation. He contributed to the development of the No Child Left Behind uh, Act, and he's worked on various reauthorizations of federal legislation, including the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, Head Start, Child Care, Higher Education, and the America Competes Act, and he'll tell you what that acronym means. So before I ask Roberto to the podium, I want to remind you that if you've got a question for him, um, write it on one of the cards that's getting passed out at the entrance, or you can tweet it in um, using the hashtag policy talks, one word. Uh, and um, Roberto, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a real honor to be with you here today uh, for this important conversation. I really want to begin by thanking uh, Sue and uh, Dean Collins and the entire faculty here at the Ford School for inviting me to be here. And of course, a uh, special thanks to the Upjohn Institute and to the Spencer Foundation for their generous support of uh, engaging in this really important topic. Uh, it's really great to be back home. It's really great to be back among my fellow Wolverines. Uh, and here at our University of Michigan community to uh, have the conversation here today. I really want to begin uh, by making uh, the connection that's rather obvious to most of us that are gathered here today, but I think it's nevertheless central to the conference and to the arc of the papers and discussions that you'll explore in the uh, coming two days. And this is really the simple reminder that uh, perhaps more than at any other time in our nation's history, higher education is really the engine for our economy and the spark that is going to continue to ignite our democracy. Uh, there are countless examples from across the country uh, of how earning a college degree really opens the doors of opportunity for families, places them on a greater pathway toward uh, uh, economic mobility, uh, and prosperity and success, examples of how the pursuit of a college degree helped young people find their place in their communities, uh, in their worlds around them, uh, and in their country. Uh, and that was certainly the case for me during my time here at the University of Michigan in the mid-90s as an undergraduate that was still feeling his way about uh, his academic path, uh, eager to set forth and to change the world. And uh, in today's economy, as President Obama reminds us, uh, a college degree is the surest rung on the ladder of opportunity into the middle class. Uh, a new global economy brings new challenges, new demands, uh, but it's very clear that gone is that economy for, of, a t of a quarter century ago uh, where a worker with a high school credential uh, could make at least half of what a college graduate would earn uh, across their lifetime. So we know that education is the strategy for our 21st century economy. Uh, our children are competing with the rest of the world for jobs uh, of the future, and our long-term economic security uh, is directly tied to the quality of the public education uh, that we can provide today. That's why this topic uh, that we're exploring over the course of this conference is so important. Uh, you know, many of you here uh, are uh, esteemed uh, in this field, in this academic discipline. You're familiar with the statistics. You know that our economy clearly rewards those with a higher education. We know that uh, our college graduates 
have higher earnings, uh, that we know also that there's a real imperative here is eight and 10 uh, new jobs in the US will require some post-secondary education or training. And the 30 of the 30 fastest growing jobs in our economy today, over half of those require a four-year degree. Uh, but beyond this economic imperative, we also have to, at the onset here of our conversations, remind ourselves of the moral imperative that we have, uh, the moral responsibility we have, in that we're a nation that defines ourselves based on our ability to provide every individual the opportunity to rise as far as their hard work and their initiative will take them. And so increasing access to higher education is fundamental to living up uh, uh, to that moral commitment. And it's one of the best things that we can do for our country. Uh, this is why we've organized our efforts in Washington around the goal that the president laid out when he first arrived at the White House. Uh, and this is a goal to lead the world with the highest proportion of college graduates by 2020. Uh, our Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, he calls this goal our North Star. Uh, and that's exactly what it is. It's a guidepost and it's a reminder to us to strengthen education at every level uh, and to deliver on this challenge. So in order to reach this goal, we'll need to increase the share of college graduates that we produce in our nation by 50% over what we've produced in 2009. And by the numbers, this means 8 million more young adults will need to earn associates and bachelor's degrees by the end of this decade. We'll have to outpace our current rate of degree attainment relative to our population growth, which has us more or less producing about 3 million more college graduates by the end of the decade. So we've placed such an emphasis on this 2020 goal because we know that higher education is such an important investment worth making. Uh, we know, again, the median earnings of bachelor's degree recipients are markedly higher, uh, $21,000 more uh, than high school graduates. Uh, and we know that it really does provide a true uh, uh, ladder into the middle class. Of adults who grow up in the middle class, 31% of those that uh, have a college degree were upwardly mobile into the top uh, income quintile between 2000 and 2008. Uh, this is compared with just about 12% of those that did not have a college degree. So especially for students that are graduating into weak economies, uh, uh, it, it frequently some, and, and can often take time to find the path that ensures that going to college was really worth it. But those with more education tend to experience larger increases in their earnings as they age. And uh, we know that based on current earnings patterns that if people with bachelor's degrees work full time over their work lives, they'll earn about two thirds more uh, on average than our high school graduates. So uh, we know we, we have this imperative that uh, is a backdrop to this 2020 goal. It's an ambitious goal. The pace of uh, progress for our young Americans in college attainment uh, is, uh, is very ambitious under this charge. Uh, but one thing is really clear, we're not going to meet it unless we really embrace a spirit of change uh, in our higher education system. Uh, and that is going to involve a shared responsibility that spans from leadership at our higher education institutions to state legislators and governors to public and private stakeholders, parents, and of course, ultimately students to be able to accelerate toward this 2020 challenge. Uh, reaching the goal will require also a collective will on the part of policymakers and, and partners, uh, higher education leaders, philanthropy, others, to really ask the tough questions that are ultimately going to foster change in our higher education system. Are we doing right by our students? Do they have the reliable sources of aid and support that they need to be successful in, as they pursue their degree? Uh, do our colleges and universities have the proper capacity to harness innovation? And are we equipped with the right incentives to drive reform focused on improving the educational experience for students while they're on campus? Are our federal and state policies well attuned with a mission, a vision, and a focus that promotes not only higher education access, but college completion? Are we confronting the state of teaching and learning on our college campuses? and aligning it with the needs and demands of 21st century learners? 
Are we prepared to assume the collective responsibility to address the inequities that we have in college attainment, the college completion gap that still manifests itself on the basis of socioeconomic status and racial lines, and ultimately is a serious threat to our economic standing in the world. We still have only about 30% of our young African American students today and 20% of our Latino, young Latino population today that holds an associate's degree or higher. And then of course, one of the key questions that's posed most relevant to uh, this convening today, are we prepared to do what's needed to tackle college affordability as a national imperative? You know, America's home to the best colleges and universities in the world. And yet too many Americans, for a variety of reasons, feel like pursuing a post-secondary degree or certificate might be out of reach for them. Some are clearly hindered by the shortcomings that we have in our K-12 education system. There's no question that we need to do better to measure up to the challenges of graduating each and every one of our young people prepared for college and a successful career. But for many others, there is still this belief that college costs can be prohibitive. And whatever the reason, a person's decision not to go to college, not to pursue that higher education, can have a direct impact on his or her long-term economic future and on the collective prosperity of our communities and of our country. So for these reasons, our administration has been really clear in our focus. We want to help more students prepare for and succeed in higher education with a blueprint that is going to dramatically expand uh, educational opportunity beginning in these early years, make the needed changes we need in our, in our K-12 education system, and commit to putting an affordable, high-quality higher education degree within the reach of every American. Now, this issue of paying for college is something that more than likely has affected everyone here in this room. Uh, and I know while we are here to study this topic uh, in, in greater depth, we also know that it's an issue that affects us personally, individually. I know for me, the cost of college, the affordability of my degree, along with the stellar education, of course, that Michigan stood to provide me, was a really important uh, factor in the decision in terms of why I chose this school for my undergraduate studies. But the fact of the matter is, while many Americans across the country understand why a post-secondary degree is so valuable, many folks still don't have access to higher education for one big reason, uh, and that is that too many of our families still feel priced out. Now, I know you'll hear plenty over the course of this conference on trends in student loan debt for completers and for non-completers across our country. We're really fortunate to have wonderful data just released this week uh, by the College Board, and I believe uh, uh, Sandy Baum will kick off your day tomorrow with an overview of this new data uh, that really provides the most comprehensive analysis of where we are with respect to our trends in pricing and in cost. But it's worth noting that at least one trend has remained constant as we look over the course of this data, and that's that net price has continued to tick up. Uh, across our institutions, and the growth has come at a time when family income has not recovered from the economic downturn. So as the President has stated several times on the bus tour that he took just over the summer in the Northeast, uh, you know, he said family incomes are just not growing fast enough relative to the price of college. Uh, tuition and fees at our public four-year colleges is now more than three times higher than it was 30 years ago. And while over this same period, income has only risen 16% for middle class families. So this has real implications on a family's decision about whether or not to pursue higher education. All across the country, families are asking themselves uh, this question around college costs. We hear it. We, we get these questions and we get these letters from families across America at the White House every day. And, you know, I think... Uh, the administration has a lot to be proud of in terms of the amount of grant aid and tax benefits and the progress that we've made to try to make sure that we have more of a, of a reliable uh, and affordable source of aid for families to be able to pursue college. I think as the data that you'll see uh, that Sandy will present shows, uh, in many cases, the uptick in Pell, the uptick in some of the other uh, 
grant aid that we've provided has been an uh, uh, enabler for net prices to not jump higher than they have. Uh, and in many venues, uh, the bang that we get for our federal student aid uh, is quite high. You know, at our community colleges, in many instances, it covers full freight for tuition and fees with room to spare for other expenses in a student's budget. Uh, so we've, we have set forth to uh, eliminate wasteful subsidies in our higher education student aid system, um, subsidies that were funding banks to the tunes of uh, $68 billion over 10 years, and to be able to recapture and reinvest those dollars, uh, over $60 billion of those dollars in college access. We've increased the maximum Pell Grant for working in for middle class families by more than $900. That's now reaching over 9.5 million families. We've created the American Opportunity Tax Credit, which provides a maximum of $2,500 per year uh, in tax credits for college, and it's helping more than 11 million families defray the costs of college annually. You know, we've simplified the FAFSA. We've taken initial steps to have a shorter form and better online format and a skip logic that imports tax information uh, for, for uh, uh, individuals who are completing the FAFSA uh, and for their families. And studies show that if we do even more along this front, uh, we can really boost college enrollment rates. Uh, and we've worked to invest in college access grant programs to help be partners with states in increasing the number of low-income students who are prepared to enter and to succeed in college and to manage their debt. But for a majority of students who borrow in order to attend school, the increased price at four-year colleges can still be a significant burden. Uh, and it's coupled with a really important factor here, uh, which is cost shifting as states slash higher education budgets. As we see those budgets go down, families are being asked to shoulder the increasing cost of attendance and the increasing sums that are needed to finance their child's higher education. You know, all told, looking at data from the College Board and from TECAS, the average student loan borrower now graduates with over $26,000 in debt. Loan default rates are rising at some institutions, and as, as we'll discuss over the course of this conference, many young adults are burdened with that debt as they graduate college and begin the next chapter in their lives. This debt also undoubtedly has some level of ripple effect across our economy. So the fact that prices have continued to grow uh, is causing some families to beg this fundamental question around, can I afford this? Can I afford college? I know we fundamentally all believe that students can, and we are continuing to try to deliver that message. But despite the statistics that prove what a great investment college makes, what a strong return of investment that has later in life, the answer may not be so transparent to students and to families who are evaluating their options and assessing whether or not, at this moment in their lives perhaps, they can handle taking on the cost of college. So when the president takes to the road and, and has a conversation with the country around college costs, at the heart of this message that he delivered this summer was a value proposition. It was making sure that higher education what we know as a central pillar to achieving the American dream is available for our students at a high quality, at an affordable price, and with a reasonable expectation that it will prepare them for success after they graduate. So at the heart of this new national conversation on college affordability is this value proposition. And we can't make significant headway in reshaping higher education to serve all students without placing the, this equation of quality, of affordability, and of outcomes front and center. You know, each year, our federal government invests over $150 billion in student financial aid. At least two-thirds of our undergraduates receive some type of credit to support their education, uh, their higher education from the federal government. And collectively, states are investing about $70 billion in public colleges and universities. But as you all know, almost all of the federal student aid that flows to colleges is given based on the number of students that enroll, choose to enroll in that school. And what's missing from the equation is an important factor, which is a focus on outcomes. 
So in order to live up to their international acclaim, our colleges and universities have to explore new ideas to improve learning and outcomes for students in the spirit of providing the most affordable and highest quality education possible. It's in this very spirit that we have earned our reputation as a nation, that our colleges and universities have collectively earned their reputation as a leader in the world. Uh, and it's again that spirit that the president is seeking to harness to maximize our investment uh, in resources, in time, and energy, and in focus on higher education. Uh, earlier this year, we put forth a series of reforms centered around this aim of demonstrating value in higher education. It's not good enough to simply enroll students without attending to persistence and completion. Our institutions should not be judged and thrive based on the amount of money they charge students. And if some institutions fail to prepare students to graduate and to succeed in the workforce, we are ultimately missing our mark. So what we need is to accelerate that innovation to help colleges focus on their fundamental mission, which is providing a great education at an affordable cost. So our administration will put forth a suite of legislative and uh, executive actions and proposals, a few of which I'd like to discuss today, that we hope will not only combat rising college costs, but really encourage innovation uh, and encourage improvement across our higher education sector. And through this increased focus on value, hopefully we'll achieve a scenario in which students can pursue high quality paths in post-secondary education that will not leave them unduly saddled with debt. Throughout this push for reform, the President's very clear that our colleges and universities will be the actors that will lead the way with respect to this change. We're looking, for the, we're looking at our higher education sector not only to contribute, continue the great work that's already underway by many institutions, but also to spearhead greater adoption for the innovations that can really lead us toward a greater vision of value for students. It's only through partnership with institutions that a spirit of reform and change will really take hold uh, and can really deliver a more affordable higher education for more Americans. Now, as I mentioned earlier, almost all federal student aid resources are allocated based on the number of students who enroll, not the number of, of degrees that are earned or what students learn. So at a time when our federal investment is at $150 billion for federal student aid, and at a time when state investment is actually diminishing relative to need, we must demand greater accountability for our funding. So the first piece of this plan that the President's put forward is to connect student aid to outcomes. We are aiming to, in turn, drive a better, more affordable education by uh, developing and publishing a new rating system for students and families to make use of. Uh, you know, we don't believe that we should be ranking schools based on how expensive they are or how much they spend on capital improvements or what other elite peer schools think, but instead on metrics that reflect real value for families and for students. Metrics that families themselves can understand. So, you know, right now we have private rankings, U.S. News and World Report and others that put out each year uh, uh, rankings on uh, academic prowess of colleges and universities. It encourages a lot of colleges and universities to focus on ways uh, to sometimes actually raise cost for students. And the President stated clearly in August that he believes we should rate colleges based on opportunity. How are we helping students from all backgrounds, and particularly our first generation and our disadvantaged students, be successful? Uh, and how are we providing that information to students and parents? You know, we're going to ask questions like, how much debt do does the average student leave with? How easy is it to pay that debt off? How many students graduate on time? How well do graduates do in the workforce? Because we believe these answers will ultimately help parents and students figure out how much of value a college truly offers. You know, and our ratings will also measure how successful colleges are at enrolling and graduating students who are on Pell Grants. It will be our firm principle that our ratings have to be carefully designed to increase, not decrease, 
the opportunities for higher education for students who face economic challenges. So this is going to take time. This is not an easy proposition, but we think it can empower students and families to make good choices. And we will give any college the chance to show that it's making a serious and consistent commitment to improvement. So a college may not be where it needs to be right now based on value, but there will be the chance to get better. You know, we're going to develop this rating system through extensive public input sessions across the country to gather inputs from parents, from students, from state leaders, from academia, from college presidents and others. And we're going to focus on measures such as access, affordability, and outcomes. These new ratings will also ensure that colleges are doing their very best to encourage our neediest students to be successful. Uh, and uh, the president has charged us with preparing this new system by the 2015-16 academic year. But we're looking e forward even beyond that, and we hope to use this rating system in a much bigger way by calling on Congress to examine this proposition of value and of ratings as it allocates federal financial aid. Under this proposal, students will still be able to choose the schools that they want. I want to make that clear. But we are proposing uh, a proposition where taxpayer dollars will proportionally go greater towards schools that we know are working the hardest to deliver on this promise of affordability and value and quality. And in addition, we want to make sure that more states are following in the footsteps of some of the leading states that are looking at performance-based funding uh, and performance-based reforms and outcomes. Uh, states like Ohio, like Indiana, like Tennessee, that are doing great work to move their state higher education systems forward uh, and to focus on attainment and completion alongside uh, enrollment and how they support their state public colleges and universities. You know, by making competitive funding available, our administration is seeking to spur state higher education reform and reshape the federal-state partnership uh, by also encouraging that states maintain their funding for public higher education. This race to the top competition, this is something that uh, was part of our administration's plans last year for higher education uh, and included again in the President's call this August, um, will be squarely focused on what we can do to support uh, greater access and affordability, particularly at our public colleges and universities where about three-quarters of America's uh, undergraduate students are currently enrolled. Now, if we're going to lead the world in, in the proportion of college graduates, we also need to be sure we are on the cutting edge of innovation uh, on our college campuses. Uh, we need American higher education to uh, do more to really focus on uh, teaching and learning and on reshaping that college experience for our students. You know, the good news is we know that there are new and often better ways of uh, pursuing teaching and learning at our higher education institutions. We don't need to look far to find examples of innovation and of pioneers that are looking at new developments and harnessing the power of innovation to lead higher education really toward a new frontier. You know, we've seen examples from across the country. We've seen competency-based learning uh, being tried now, not just online, but at, at colleges and universities across the country, uh, including colleges like Southern New Hampshire University and the University of Wisconsin system that are doing more to realign and recalibrate their system to actually reward students based on what they learn, not how much time they spend in their lecture hall or in their seat. Redesigned courses that integrate online platforms uh, are exciting new ways to bring technology in a blended flat fashion into uh, teaching and learning in our college classrooms. You know, the National Center for Academic Transformation has shown, has shown the effectiveness of thoughtful use of technology across a wide range of academic disciplines, improving outcomes for students and reducing costs by nearly 40% on average. And e-advising tools, online learning communities, special cohorts of students, 
are encouraging persistence and alerting uh, our college faculty uh, when students need additional help to be able to be successful. You know, colleges can also award prior learning credit and experience for uh, dual enrollment uh, and for opportunities uh, and learning that uh, individuals, both young adults as well, uh, as well as adults, bring uh, as they enroll in college and give them real credit for that toward their degree. So this rising tide of innovation has the potential to shake up our higher education landscape. You know, we still have a lot of approaches that are under development and too few students are actually reaping the benefits of this innovation today. But we have a proposal to do more to uh, support a new first in the world fund that will test, evaluate, and help scale innovative approaches to higher education that we hope will lead dramatically better outcomes for students. And to make sure that we are developing and recognizing the leadership across America's higher, higher education institutions to demonstrate that they are really truly helping their students learn in new and innovative ways. We're looking at new authority uh, regulatory and administrative authority to uh, issue flexibility through an experimental sites authority that we have in the Higher Education Act to promote high quality, low cost innovations in higher education and make sure that it's possible, for instance, for students to get financial aid based on how much they learn rather than the amount of time they spend in class. You know, we're looking at pilot opportunities to offer Pell Grants to high school students who are taking college courses and uh, allowing federal financial aid to be used to pay test, test fees when students are seeking early academic credit for prior learning, or combining these traditional and competency-based courses into a single program of study. Another key component of, promote, of promoting, promoting this value proposition in higher education is to provide new tools to help students and families understand their choices in the higher education landscape. You know, the new college rating system that I discussed here will help advance these efforts. Uh, but we've also made important and significant strides that we want to make sure more American families are aware of to provide data to consumers in a clear and comprehensible way through two, two, two new tools that help students and parents understand what they're doing and why they choose to, and what their choices are in terms of the higher education investment. The first is a new Know Before You Owe campaign that includes a financial aid shopping sheet. And this shopping sheet is an individualized uh, but standardized across the higher education sector financial aid award letter that students and families get on the front end to understand uh, the costs of college as well as what aid is available to them before making the final decision on where to enroll. Uh, the second is a new college scorecard. As many, as, you, as many of you saw, this was released uh, earlier this year as part of our State of the Union message. Uh, and the scorecard is designed to provide clear, concise information on cost, on graduation rate, on loan default rate, on the amount borrowed, and on employment for every degree-granting institution in the country. And we want to make that scorecard available in an interactive, easy to read format for students and families to compare colleges and to make the best decisions for their future. We also have to make sure we're attending to the high default rates that we have in some of our sectors that we know are impacting the opportunity later for students to be successful and to repay their debt. You know, we have high default rates, for instance, in the for-profit sector. Uh, where the highest average two- and three-year cohort default rates are at 13.6% and 21.8% respectively. Now, here, our administration has tried to do more to make sure that we are bringing greater regulatory attention to bring greater accountability into this career college sector, defining what it means for a program to prepare a student for gainful employment in a recognized occupation, and to construct an accountability system that distinguishes between programs that prepare students for gainful employment and those that do not. So we're looking at new metrics for these institutions to measure their success. Uh, and these regulations are aiming to support students in deciding where to pursue a post-secondary education 
by increasing the transparency of their costs and making sure that those institutions that are not delivering on gainful employment are not recipients of some of that $150 billion of our federal financial investment. Now, last the, the other uh, important element that we have to focus on here is also making sure that our borrowers have access to the tools and the resources that will help them to make responsible choices, responsible borrowing decisions, and better management of their debt during repayment. So last year we've looked at new loan counseling tools that are aimed at providing students with an interactive way to get the information they need at key points in their borrowing process. You know, and as we continue to make improvements to those tools online based on feedback from our financial aid experts, our students and our families and our college counselors, we are seeking to do more to make sure that we are uh, helping to support our borrowers at every point in their college experience. At entrance counseling, during school, and at exit counseling. We also have new options through the President's Pay As You Earn plan, which started last year and enables many of our student loan borrowers to cap their student loan repayments at 10% of their income. And additionally, the administration's budget includes a new Pay As You Earn uh, uh, plan that would expand that uh, to all student borrowers who need it. You know, part of our challenge with Pay As You Earn has been to make sure that we are targeting the subgroups of borrowers who are most likely to benefit and most likely to need this assistance. Uh, and so we are continuing to do more work in that area and implementing new streamlined applications for Pay As You Earn as well as identifying some of our borrowers that might be at risk of default, those that might be in low-income households, so that they know that they have opportunities to peg their student loan repayment to a manageable share of their uh, discretionary income every month. So I hope you'll see the thrust of the reforms I've discussed here are really squarely aimed at demonstrating value in higher education. We know that some institutions at present are enabled to do better than others uh, on this prospect. Uh, but it's our hope that with a new national conversation and a continued emphasis on outcomes, on quality, on affordability, we can collectively drive our American higher education sector toward the kind of results that will move our economy forward. Because, you know, we fiercely believe, even with student indebtedness exceeding $26,000 on average, college is worth it. Just looking uh, academically, we know we have plenty to support that claim, but there are uh, thousands of individuals around the country who are able to attest to that. And we know we all have a role to play in this vision to uh, again regain our standing internationally in terms of college completion. You all know well that the federal government can't take this issue on alone, nor should it. We need partnership across sectors, across the nation to improve our system of higher education. We need states to do their part to prioritize higher education funding. States simply can't cut their higher education budgets to balance, to balance their broader budgets and expect institutions to just make up the difference or to pass along that difference to parents. We need states to do their part to, pri or we need colleges to do their part to act with creativity and urgency to contain costs. And they must hold themselves accountable for ensuring that students get an education that prepares them for success in the workplace. And we need our families and our students empowered with the information to make good decisions about where to attend college. And they will ultimately vote with their feet. We know that our students will make decisions based on where value is highest so that they can spur the market into producing more of what's good. So ultimately, all of this is in the broader vein of educating our way to a better economy and to a stronger middle class. That's what we're focused on as an administration. Uh, and we know that education is the surest path to get there. And a higher education is one of the single most important investments that we can make along that path. So thanks very much. I look forward to uh, hearing your comments, uh, your questions, and your input for us as we move this agenda forward. Thank you very much once again.
for coming to speak with us. Uh, we have a whole bunch of questions, so I hope you're ready. Yes. All right, let's start with this one. This is from the audience. Should we be concerned that linking college ratings to outcomes like graduation will provide incentives for schools to manipulate these measures? For example, by making classes easier or weakening college degree requirements? Yes, I think we, we have to be vigilant about that. Uh, you know, this is, as I mentioned, is a, a challenging endeavor to develop a new rating system, and we have to be able to look at the interactive effect of the various variables that would be integrated there. Um, there is clearly uh, opportunity if, if we were looking at uh, graduation rates, for instance, alone uh, to game that system. Uh, and that's why we also need to be looking at new measures around quality uh, and uh, making sure that we're focused and attending to the um, rigor of teaching and learning uh, at our institutions. Uh, and we have some measures that we can look toward now uh, there, particularly looking at gainful employment as one. Uh, but we need more. We actually honestly need more innovation in that space and we need better measures. Of, uh, of teaching and learning at the post-secondary level. Uh, we have not uh, turned our attention uh, as a country uh, from an education perspective to um, developing better measures there, unlike in our K-12 and early childhood sector where there are a lot of measures around quality. Uh, yes. Roberto, my name is Mark Wiederspahn. I am a doctoral student in the higher education program here at Michigan. Uh, this is kind of similar to the question that was just asked, but do you think that there would be any type of influence of this president's score on the current accreditation system? And if there's not, um, what, what do you think about the current accreditation yes. system? And do you think there's any changes that we should be focusing on? Well, you know, I, I thank you for the question. I do think we, we need to endeavor to improve the current accreditation system. And, uh, you know, uh, part of the President's message at the beginning of this year in the State of the Union was to take on this challenge of reforming uh, accreditation. Uh, you know, I think uh, uh, as, at the institution level, you have state level as well as uh, regional uh, and discipline specific accreditors constantly coming uh, and looking at uh, whether, the, whether that institution is accredited. Many of those institutions, many of those processes do not focus. Uh, on outcomes as much as they should. Many of them focus too much on inputs. Uh, so we believe we need to have a new conversation about accreditation. We're hoping we can have that as part of the reauthorization that Congress might consider of the Higher Education Act. Uh, and we also believe we need more uh, alternate systems of accreditation because we believe that there are new innovations that are taking shape today in our higher education landscape that uh, are not either well-suited or willing to go through the uh, more traditional accreditation process, but that might be producing good outcomes for students. So we can't lose sight of that and we need an alternate process to be able to recognize that too. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I neglected to introduce myself last time. I'm Dan Kreisman, uh, Dan. a postdoc here at the Ford School. I'm gonna give you one last one about the, uh, the measures. What are the defining pr parameters of what the administration considers, quote, high quality education? For example, can you give us some more specifics of the factors that might go into the ratings? Sure, well, uh, you know, we're, we're looking uh, at, our, at the rating system at uh, measuring issues like access, uh, you know, how many, what is the share of uh, uh, low income Pell eligible students, for instance, that the, the institution is enrolling. Um, we're looking at issues around affordability. What is the change in, uh, in net price, for instance, uh, and how does that square with uh, you know, uh, some of the other uh, data that we have with respect to maybe if it's a public institution, how much the state's investing in that institution. Uh, and we're looking at factors around outcomes. We're looking at default rates, uh, uh, and we want to look at uh, some measure of uh, of uh, gainful employment, some measure of uh, future earnings uh, as an important uh, proxy there. You know, right now, uh, uh, through the IPEDS process, uh, the government collects uh, data on about 15 different indicators across our uh, higher education institutions. Uh, so we have quite a bit of data already out there. 
Uh, I think the challenge here for us is going to be uh, how to distill that in a really thoughtful system that is fair to institutions, that compares uh, uh, institutions uh, in a fair manner because uh, our higher education sector is tremendously diverse. Uh, it's one of its strengths, right? We have great two-year colleges, great four-year colleges, public, private, career colleges, more liberal arts institutions. Uh, so we want to be able to have a system that's going to uh, recognize the nuance there. Uh, and over time, we'll be setting forth a technical advisory group uh, that will help um, our Department of Education navigate uh, the development of this type of system. Um, I guess we're going to kind of switch gears a little bit here. Uh, this question's probably a three-hour, needs a three-hour response, but uh, five minutes will do. Uh, let's talk about gainful employment. Okay. <laughs> um, let's talk about it. Yeah. Uh, can you, just real quickly, where are we at on the state of gainful employment? How big of a, of a factor is this going to be in the higher education system? And do you think that such a policy will possibly deter students from seeking out specific majors mm -hmm. like philosophy? Uh, th that is another three-hour lecture. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll try to tackle it. You know, um, our administration has taken the first foray into uh, regulating on uh, the congressional requirement for gainful employment of career college programs. These are programs that are vocational in nature that are preparing students to uh, uh, enter a particular uh, field of employment. Um, you know, we have promulgated a rule earlier in our administration uh, that looked at debt to earnings ratios uh, as an important uh, measure of success, uh, as well as default rates. Uh, in the context of calibrating a new system uh, that looks at gainful employment and at whether individual programs, not whole schools, but individual programs offered within schools um, are delivering uh, on this uh, commitment uh, and this requirement by statute. Uh, many of those schools are actually, many of those programs are operated at community colleges, uh, uh, but many of them are also operated at for-profit institutions. And many of those for-profit institutions, uh, uh, some of them are wonderful actors. Uh, others, uh, unfortunately, are not delivering, uh, uh, or their you know students are graduating uh, unable to enter gainful employment or with ve very high levels of debt or default. So uh, the key to making sure that um, we are not uh, curtailing uh, uh, unnecessarily the options for students is to make sure that we have a thoughtful system. That's measured. I would point out that uh, we're already beginning to collect data uh, from the sector, and uh, I think we're seeing a relatively low share, uh, less than modest share, of institutions that actually are not able to meet the proposed metrics that were initially um, part of our administration's rule. Um, but there are a number of institutions out there that, uh, that have programs that um, uh, that didn't measure up. Uh, we now are back at the negotiating table. That's where we are right now because uh, there was a part of our rule that was uh, stayed by the court, by the circuit court, uh, and we are um, reconvening negotiators to look at uh, redrafting a new rule around gainful employment. Uh, I can't talk too much about the particulars of that rule because um, those negotiations are actually ongoing. Uh, into the next into next month, uh, and that regulation will continue to take shape. What I will say is we are going to continue to uh, pursue this because we believe that uh, it's an important um, function of our government to be good stewards of ta taxpayer dollars. We do not want taxpayer dollars going to programs that are saddling students with uh, with debt and that are not resulting in uh, gainful employment uh, uh, and not enabling them to repay that debt. Uh, and we are going to take a close look at um, the concentration of programs that are failing those measures on the basis of the disciplines, right? Uh, right now, I don't think we have data that suggests that there is a particular discipline that would be disproportionately impacted by the administration's original gainful employment rule. 
Uh, but we'll continue to look at that moving forward because we now have, uh, uh, we'll soon have two years worth of data to be able to take a closer look at that question. I majored in philosophy. <laughs> I'm not sure how much I would recommend that. So here's one from uh, the Twitter world. If you could make one change uh, in the entire education system to improve equity, I had several questions about equity, what huh. would that be? Uh, well, that, it's a challenge because there's a whole lot we need to do in equity across the pipeline from cradle through career. Uh, but I think the single most important change that can be made in terms of uh, really tackling p the impact of poverty on learning uh, is to provide uh, all of our children a high quality education before they reach kindergarten. Uh, and this, the contours of that plan as the President's proposed it is to provide preschool for all low and middle income four year olds in the country uh, and make sure that that preschool is high quality. We have had um, study upon study that have demonstrated the return of an, on investment upwards of seven dollars for every dollar invested. Uh, there's individual benefits, there are broader community benefits, economic benefits. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, we've seen this also um, tried in communities around the country, uh, both at the state level and at the, at the local level. Uh, and we've seen um, tremendous uh, impact here. Uh, I would turn folks to uh, the recent study that was released um, by uh, the uh, uh, Foundation on Child Development uh, that uh, Deborah Phillips who was the author of one of the um, Neurons to Neighborhoods National Science Foundation studies, uh, helped compile that shows the benefits of high quality pre-K. Uh, we believe that it's one of the key drivers for equity moving forward. Uh, and if we can do that, we have uh, the opportunity to begin to remediate that uh, achievement gap and that learning gap that already is manifesting itself at 60 points between low-income children and their more affluent peers by the time they reach kindergarten. Uh, this is uh, another one from the Twitter. Um, not the Twitter, from Twitter. Uh, <laughs> there is no empirical evidence on effective loan counseling. So what is the Department of Ed doing to revise its services, and why not fund research? Uh, good idea. I think we, uh, we should do more to fund more research on that front. Uh, you know, we do believe that uh, we need to do a better job of reaching borrowers and providing them greater counseling. Uh, you know, we uh, definitely know that the tools that were provided previously were not sufficient. So what we've done is gone back to the drawing board and created a new interface um, that all students can uh, interact on. At um, uh, It's at uh, www.ed.gov. If you link on student aid, you can uh, um, uh, interact with a college counseling tool and loan counseling tool that, as I mentioned in the remarks, um, really reaches borrowers at every point uh, in, their, um, in their college career from entrance through school and then obviously exit counseling. You know, information uh, and transparency around uh, uh, data is one of the most important things that we can do uh, in this sector uh, in terms of providing a greater uh, focus on outcomes and on quality. Uh, in terms of making sure that families and students are well equipped to make good decisions. Uh, and that's just something that we know, we know to be true. Uh, I think we can probably fund research to better calibrate our loan counseling tools, but um, we don't, as an as a, a approach, see any harm in trying to provide students uh, better and more targeted assistance and help in understanding the options available to them. To meet the President's goal for degree attainment, higher education must engage more non-traditional adult and part-time students. Yes. Federal policy seems to be shifting towards tying federal aid to shorter times to degree completion. How can these two imperatives be reconciled at the national policy level? That's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I think we have to acknowledge that, uh, you know, four years is no longer a traditional trajectory for college attainment, right? I mean, I think we have that uh, reality, uh, you know, across our even 
um, traditional uh, four-year public colleges and universities. That is certainly the case, if not more so, uh, at our community colleges where you have, um, uh, you know, and increasingly at our public four years where we have more students that are working while they're pursuing their studies, uh, more adults that are returning uh, to pursue their studies and balancing work and family. And we know that we can't reach the president's uh, charge to us around 2020 uh, if we don't do more to help adults be successful in the system. So, uh, you know, we have to keep that in mind as we're shaping policies uh, and moving, uh, moving things forward. Uh, one example is to think about what we can do to support uh, perhaps some changes or, or uh, modifications to the Pell Grant, particularly for adult students. Right? And I think we've seen some innovative research uh, uh, coming out of um, uh, Louisiana, uh, you know, looking at performance-based uh, awards for uh, um, degree attainment that aren't necessarily pegged to the specific time frame, but where uh, awards are allocated based on the amount of uh, credit that that individual accrues, uh, almost as a reward and or uh, support as they pursue their studies, increasing and focusing on persistence. Um, you know, I also think there are other interventions, uh, smaller learning communities and cohorts of students um, uh, moving through together, particularly for our adult students and our non-traditional students, so to speak, uh, that we've found to be, uh, uh, that research has found to be uh, successful. Um, so I think we need a, a, a myriad strategies there to be able to support our adult students, and certainly we don't want to uh, have a one-size-fits-all uh, policy um, uh, when it comes to making sure that our students are successful. We have to take in, into mind those, those populations. Um, this one's going to be, uh, I think this might be from a professor. Because um, <laughs> uh, it deals with massive open online courses. Um, okay. They've kind of been uh, viewed as a way to increase access at low cost. Uh, but how do we ensure quality? And what does the administration's role, or what does the administration yeah. think of the role of massive open online courses in higher education? Uh, you know, we believe that technology can be a real driver for innovation in higher education. Uh, when it comes to massive online courses, massive open online courses or MOOCs, mm -hmm. uh, we believe that uh, we have to do more to uh, scale the types of assessments that are needed to know whether they work. Uh, you know, we don't yet have uh, the series of um, uh, performance-based assessments that enable us to know that uh, as students are progressing through a particular uh, online module or MOOC um, that they'll be successful. Uh, and so I think those, those assessments are currently being developed by a number of the various providers. Uh, we hope that, um, and we believe we have a role at the federal level to help support greater um, assessment uh, and, greater, and greater tools that can be used as um, uh, institutions of higher education and private individuals develop these MOOCs so that we have a better sense of uh, what's working uh, in that space. I think we're still learning a great deal uh, about what's working and what could work uh, when it comes to online learning in higher education. Uh, our National Science Foundation is doing some studies of that work as well. Um, so we're gonna continue to learn from that uh, I'll say the one thing that I think is most exciting in this space is that once we're able to understand what adaptive platforms and what uh, online in innovations are most successful with our learners, we can apply that to the science of learning on college campuses. And if we can help support a new conversation with our faculty members about how to use technology and embed that in a blended way in their coursework, that has the potential to reach a far greater number of students than uh, uh, that are currently enrolled and currently pursuing their higher education than just relying on MOOCs as a substitute platform for higher ed. Okay, 
Okay, there are, there are two questions on this. I'm going to amalgamate them here for you. And I'm also going to paraphrase because one of them needs paraphrasing. Um, <laughs> so, in essence, why create a rating system rather than just provide public information? And uh -huh. then the other one says, another no before you know campaign. Um, why is this administration so strongly focused on consumer choice? Well, you know, I'll, I'll take the last one first, which is that uh, uh, we believe that the pursuit of higher education for too many students is too opaque, honestly. Uh, we believe that, uh, you know, we have not done enough to help support states in the um, process of, uh, you know, defining uh, standards and defining learning progressions that will help, that are very clear that are easy to understand for the public and that help particularly young people graduating from high school understand what it will take for them to get their college degree, understand the various pathways they have you know, to reach, their, to reach a four-year degree, for, for instance. Uh, that's not to say that we're not seeing innovation in that space. You know, we're starting to see you know, states like Florida and uh, other systems, uh, you know, the Arizona system, for instance, that's starting to look at uh, uh, defining learning outcomes and aligning that um, articulation between two-year and four-year colleges so that students are actually able to more seamlessly finish their associate's degree, transfer to a four-year institution and finish that and finish that four-year degree and half the cost sometimes uh, of students that might start out at that four-year institution. So, uh, you know, that's just one example of a place where we don't have enough transparency uh, for, for families and for students. Uh, we collect a bunch of data, as I mentioned. We collect 15 different indicators. Uh, we don't provide that data on a, in a really easy to understand, reliable format for parents uh, or for families. So if you think about higher education as one of the most important investments you can make as a family, you're sitting around the college table or sitting around the, the kitchen table and thinking about choosing a college, you want to be able to have that data just as you would if you were buying a home and you'd be able to go on Home's database and be able to print out a comparable format to at least know it's not going to tell you everything about those particular um, options, but it at least provides uh, a level of comparable data. Uh, we believe that's needed, uh, and that's why we're so focused on uh, providing consumers uh, information. Now, you know, that's not all we need to do, right? That is not where this conversation needs to begin and end. We have a lot more... Uh, to do to support affordability and innovation uh, to actually make sure that um, that translates into opportunity for students. Uh, I forgot the first part of your question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I think that covered most of it. Okay. A couple of mm -hmm. um, so Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom have income-based loan repayment programs for all students. Yeah. The U.S. limits this option to the lowest income borrowers. Why not expand this option for everyone? Well, I think it's a good question and a good issue for us to look at. You know, we are focused right now on our low income borrowers because uh, we have only a fraction of, we believe we have captured only a fraction of the students who most need and could most benefit from income-based repayment. Uh, and that's why I mentioned we are starting to target some of our subsets of borrowers who we know might need uh, the most help and could really benefit from IBR. But ultimately, I think it's a good question and a good debate for us to have uh, and something good for Congress to consider in terms of whether we can expand IBR more actively uh, to uh, more students uh, and ultimately to all students across the country. Um, you know, we're not there yet. That's an expensive proposition as well, so it's something that we would really have to uh, um, have the funding to be able to support. But, you know, it's something that we are... Uh, that we're eager to, to talk more about and to explore Congress. So here's a question from Twitter about loan repayment. It says, loan repayment is complex. Do you anticipate a partnership between the Department of Education and Treasury so repayment can go through the tax system? Yes. I mean, I, I, I do think we are going to try to do more uh, uh, to support this. We are... Uh, you know, we've been able to, uh, fortunately, uh, really forge a strong partnership on the income-based repayment uh, front, as well as on the FAFSA front, uh, with our friends at Treasury to be able to import tax information uh, 
in a more seamless way um, so that uh, individuals are better able to know whether they qualify for benefits. Um, you know, we think we, sh we, we think we should try to do more of that and try to do more of that experimentation with respect to um, uh, loan repayment as well. Uh, and, you know, I think we're not quite there yet, uh, but, you know, I think we're, we're beginning to have conversations that haven't been had before between our Department of Education and the Department of Treasury to explore the possibilities there. Uh, this is from Twitter, too. I think the first sentence is written in some sort of Twitter language. <laughs> so if I read there it... There are a lot of hashtags. <laughs> yeah. Um, 21.8% cohort default rates in some for-profit schools. I don't know if that's a question or... Uh, but at what point do we shut them down or cut them out of federal aid? Yes. I mean, we believe we need to cut them out at some point of federal aid. Uh, you know, that is the whole premise behind the gainful employment regulation. Uh, and, I, again, I can't speak to the details of that in terms of the thresholds. Um, you know, we had a rule that we were very... Um, proud to promulgate as an administration on this. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think, um, fortunately, that rule would have not only had the effect of making sure that we were um, failing to provide the financial aid to the worst programs that clearly are bad actors in the sector, because that, that level of default is just, you know, over 20% default rate. But it also, I think, potentially has the effect of the broader sector of career college programs improving their performance. Uh, and again, you know, federal regulation uh, sometimes has this impact of, if it's crafted in a thoughtful way, of raising the bar and helping to improve the performance of other actors that may not be subject to the sanction, um, but that uh, um, see that coming and know that there, there's a uh, drive to get better and a need to do better. Uh, we believe that that's needed, um, particularly in this sector, um, for the very issue that I mentioned in my remarks and that the default rates are so high. So on encouraging colleges to cut costs, uh, so one way the colleges will cut costs is to increase the share of faculty or part-time or low-paid adjuncts. Uh -huh. And this seems likely to erode, equ erode quality. Uh, how will the emphasis on affordability uh, present, prevent colleges from cutting labor costs at the potential? So will, it, will this, m encouraging them to maybe uh, hire more part-time faculty, possibly erode teaching quality and have an adverse effect from what you're going for? Well, uh, you know, I think this is similar to one of the earlier questions as well, which is that we need to keep, an, we need to keep our eye on quality here. Uh, and this can't be a trade-off. Um, in the name of affordability that compromises the quality of instruction or education at our institutions. And it's a challenge. I mean, it's really, on, I'll be honest, you know, I mean, making sure that we are, we have the right measures uh, to know that um, our students are receiving a high quality education. You know, we have our outcome data post-graduation. That's the best and most reliable thing that we can look toward right now. Um, but you know, we we know that there are tremendous benefits to great uh, to a great higher education, including the great liberal arts education that I received here. So, uh, you know, we don't want to curtail that, uh, and uh, and you know, we need to keep an eye on uh, making sure that uh, we have um, uh, good labor practices across our education sector. That's something that this president is um, very focused on and uh, and very supportive of. Um. Ideally, the percentage of low-income students attending college would and should be much higher than it currently is. However, how do you convince colleges from a business standpoint that yes. creating programs to recruit these students is a good idea, mm -hmm. as low-income students would be bringing in less money to the school and they need more aid in the form of institutional grants and loans? That's a great question. Uh, you know, it gets to the premise of shared responsibility here. And it's not just around recruitment. It's actually around enrollment and completion. Uh, you know, because we have uh, actually some really good recruitment programs and practices across our institutions, particularly and a number of our selective institutions, including the University of Michigan, does a, a fine job of recruiting um, our low-income students. 
Um, you know, we also need to collectively share our best practice around making sure that we're retaining those students and that they are completing uh, at our institutions of higher education. Uh, and that is another area where we want to really invest in innovation and bring forth what's working well uh, at our colleges and universities and help scale those types of practices uh, at our institutions. Uh, but you know, ultimately we believe that we need to have real commitments here um, from, our, from our institutions of higher education to take those students. Uh, you know, we need to have a real honest conversation. And again, I'm not um, uh, really advancing new policies in this space today in this conversation, but I do believe we need a national conversation around admissions. You know, we need a national conversation around uh, retention. We need a discussion around those types of trade-offs around packaging aid. And, you know, we have right now a, a situation where if an institution is well endowed and uh, it has a real commitment to diversity, it has the ability and uh, the will to be able to make more pathways available for more low-income students than, others, than other institutions sometimes do. Uh, you know, and then we have the question of public education for the public good and public higher education for the public good, uh, which is something that I think and I hope we as a country have a conversation about uh, in this higher education reauthorization because the strength of our public colleges and universities um, is that it has to be able to serve all of our individuals and particularly be that pathway for our low income and first generation college goers to be successful. Uh, so. You know, I don't, I don't have a perfect answer for that, um, but you know, I think there's a, it's a question of um, will, uh, at both political will of the institution, of its board of regents, of its leadership, uh, of the state, uh, and then also um, means uh, to implement programs and practices, both recruitment and retention, that are successful. I think we have time for one more. Um, how is the administration looking at the, into the quality of K-12 preparation in terms of college success? So, uh, you know, we have uh, forged an ambitious agenda to um, really uh, improve the quality of our elementary and secondary education system uh, over the course of the first term. This is the, another lecture, which could be another couple hours. But, you know, ultimately we've, uh, really launched uh, a new national effort to help support states in a new partnership around raising standards so that they actually prepare students for college and career level work. Um, I, don't think our, I don't think the public fully um, appreciates where we were uh, with respect to college and career readiness as a, as a system. Uh, we had standards that you know, were defined by 50 states and, and, you know, curriculum, obviously that's defined by, um, uh, you know, over 15,000 school boards. So we have a very disparate system, but we need, if, if we are to be successful in preparing our students for college, we need to begin with the expectation that they must graduate, each and every one of them, college ready. Uh, and that's college ready at a level of learning that prepares them for entrance into a four-year college without the need for remediation. Uh, so we had states that were uh, setting standards, let's take seventh grade math for instance, at uh, levels that were 70, uh, of mastery, levels of mastery, that were 70 points below neighboring states, right? That's over two grade levels worth of learning in terms of what's expected for students to be successful. Just illustrative in, in middle school math. Uh, we are not going to be competitive as a country if we are having that level of variation in that a student zip code determines the level of mastery at which he or she is uh, expected to attain. Uh, so uh, we have launched a race to the top uh, and we've supported a new uh, a reform and redesign of, of the No Child Left Behind Act with new flexibility uh, agreements with our states uh, to be able to recalibrate these systems, these state systems to college and career readiness. And I think once we're able to really raise those expectations for all of our students so that they are competing uh, in earnest uh, with students across the globe, um, rather than learning at a level that, uh, of mastery that is really substandard, um, 
only then will we really be able to uh, get where we need to go with respect to preparing all of our students for college. I was told we have time for one more. So okay. I have this last one here. Um, in a rating system, we'd like long run measure. We would like long run measures like earnings because we think that the short run measures might not accurately reflect the quality of the school. Uh, it doesn't look like we will have those in our rating system when it starts. How will the system get around something like that? Well, you know, I think we're going to need to look at at the measures that are at our avail. I, I don't want to predetermine what uh, specific metrics will uh, be in the system nor how they will interact because that is something that is still uh, under development, careful development by our administration and is something that we're going to be seeking public comment on uh, and advice from technical experts uh, about. Um, I will say that, uh, you know, I think we need to look at um, as reliable data as we can find with respect to earnings uh, and post-graduate uh, outcomes. Um, and we're hopeful that we will have um, some good long-term data to be able to look at. I don't know whether it's going to be reliable and comparable across every institution, uh, but we're going to um, uh, keep our eye on that and, uh, you know, we're going to look to the support and help of experts to um, figure out how that might be calibrated into a broader system. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto.